Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, still on lockdown, still here in New York City, still wishing I could get across that river into New Jersey and play on some of those juicy online sites. We have now had two consecutive weeks in a row where (laughs) I said consecutive in a row, redundant a little bit, uh, (laughs) where I have spoken to. Uh, guests who told me that I should get over there and play on the unbelievably juicy online games that are going on. Um, Two weeks ago, it was Elliot Rowe, who was basically telling me, like, do whatever you have to do to get across the river. And then, of course, last week's special guest, Katie Stone, who uh, was definitely echoing the sentiments, (laughs) to say the least, that Elliot had, uh, you know, espoused. So, I haven't made it yet, guys, and the reason why is because I'm a hero, okay? I'm on lockdown. I'm on quarantine. I have no symptoms whatsoever, thank God. I'm happy to say as I knock on wood that I'm not showing any signs of coronavirus, Uh, but I'm at the epicenter, as the media seems to like to call my fair city and state, New York, New York, of where all this is happening, and so I'm being extra cautious. I do have family across the river in New Jersey, and once I'm sure that I'm fine and they're all fine, I'm going to get over there and I'm going to have some great hands for you guys from the juicy New Jersey online poker scene uh, in the weeks to come. But for now, I'm still here, um, you know, basically on lockdown. I'm I've quarantined myself, and I'm just doing my best to try to help keep myself and everybody else in my city as safe as we can be during this difficult time Uh, i'm hoping that for many of you being able to listen to the podcast is a great way to escape from the uh, harsh realities of everyday life that are uh, all around us and this week uh, to help put a big smile on your face we have a favorite guest and one that hasn't been on and he says in over a year i guess that's accurate it's been quite a while either way but you know him and you love him and you're going to be so glad that he's back on with us this week snossed and lost himself our old friend Jason Smith is back. Jason, how are you? Great, Clayton. Clayton, I'm uh, really excited to be back here again. It's been way too long. Yeah, way too long to say the least. So uh, what have you been doing? I understand you haven't been playing that much poker. Yeah, so I just started recently kind of getting back into playing a little bit more uh, over the last uh, couple of months, I guess, since uh you know, everybody's kind of been on lockdown and there's been less things to do out in the world. I've definitely been playing a little bit more poker. But yeah, it took about six months off. Um, I managed the ACR Stormers and we've grown that team in the last year and a half from eight members to 70. Wow. So, yeah, so uh, I've had my hands full to say the least. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Um, so you haven't, you didn't play for six months. You've been getting your feet wet again. Uh, what made you decide to take that six month break? Were you just running bad and you needed to reset or was life getting in the way? What was going on there? I, yes. I, I'm asking because I've never taken six months off from poker ever. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there was a lot of different things, I guess, that played into it and it wasn't an intentional break. It was just mm-hmm. sort of the way life worked out, you know? Yeah. Um, I I definitely took a break intentionally up front because things hadn't been going so well. Uh, I kind of lost the I, I lost the ability to spend a lot of time studying. Um, the game wasn't coming as easily. I was you know a combination of running bad and just not putting the work in that I needed to be putting in if I was going to be playing all the hours that I had been playing. And so I took a little bit of a break and then. I was just sort of really enjoying the break. I was enjoying spending the time with my family, my wife and kids. I was enjoying just sort of being away from the game. It got to a point in the middle of the break where I didn't know if I'd ever play again. Wow. Like I just re- I just really enjoyed not playing poker. The stress of poker wasn't with me and I just Yeah, I don't know what uh 
I guess it, what kind of brought me back, you know, I just decided to play one day and I really, really enjoyed playing again. And I was really, I really got back into it. So I've been playing a couple of days a week, two or three days a week now, but yeah, yeah. It was one of those things where, um, I was just busy. I decided I needed a break and then I just sort of, I, I was enjoying my time away. So that was it. Just when I thought I was out, they keep pulling me back in. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, well, I never, I never had any plans, though. Like I said, it wasn't like I was like, oh, I'm going to take a six month break or even a two week break. It was just sort of, you know, the way life sort of unfolded for me. Yeah. Well, I guess not really being an online player, although uh, I have been dabbling a little bit on ACR lately, uh, but I don't really consider myself an online player. Uh, The nature of my life is that I always have breaks from poker and that I've never fully relied on it. Uh, for my livelihood. Uh, so I guess for me, that's that's been sort of why I haven't needed a break, I guess, because I, I never really felt that stress that you referred to a moment ago, um, sure. which I can understand. Like if, you, if you're trying to put food on the table and you're also running bad and, you know, the uh, coffers are starting to get a little thin and, you know, the bankroll is suffering and, and maybe you're not playing your best because, you know, just the game isn't fun anymore. Uh, I think certainly walking away, whether with intent of coming back or never coming back, is probably a good idea for most pros. Yep, yep, absolutely. All right, so uh, I wanted to hear about what you've noticed after the six months off. Um, I can tell you that I've noticed ACR used to be uh, the toughest games. To me, I just never had any, any success on there, maybe coming from a live background and then playing against a bunch of uh, human bots or bot bots or whatever they had on there. I just felt like I couldn't beat the game no matter what. Um, but lately, maybe since so many people are maybe dabbling that, that otherwise would not be, I feel the games have gotten, uh, shall we say, substantially juicier. And I'm wondering yes. if you noticed the same. <laughs> I think that is an absolutely fair assessment. Yes. Yeah. They've they've definitely the the field sizes have grown and uh, the average player has definitely declined in skill level. Yes. Yeah. We're both trying to be as delicate about this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as we possibly can because you know no matter what you want to respect your opponents and everybody starts somewhere, right? I mean, the fact that your opponents aren't as experienced. Uh, doesn't make them worse human beings than you. No, of it's course just, not. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's amazing some of the play we're seeing lately online. So, um, yeah. So I wanted to to get into that a little bit. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about how many hands have you played since you got back in business, and uh, what what kind of games have you been uh, doing since you've gotten back into getting your feet wet? Uh, I think I must have played at least 50,000 hands in the last couple of months. Oh, so you're not just getting your feet wet. You're no, playing I'm... some serious <laughs> poker. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm playing a lot. I'm playing a lot when I play. I'm definitely, uh, firing away right now. I feel like the games are so good. Um, I did. So I've slowed it down to a couple days a week, two, three days a week for the last two or three weeks. But there was a stretch where things started, where everything was getting so good and I think I played 15 straight days at one Oh, point. that's a lot. Yeah. And uh, well, it was easy kind of like to take care of all of the, the work stuff and life stuff during the day and then, you know, kind of uh, eat dinner with the family. And then it was like, oh, I have this evening and, uh, you know, I don't have anywhere to be tomorrow because we're all quarantined. So we'll just fire up another session, you know? Yeah. Why not? Right. And and uh, the schedule's kind of good almost 24 hours a day now. So um yeah yeah it's really easy to get a ton of hands in right now i've noticed a lot of players on acr from specific countries like chile uh portugal and brazil so do you know whether acr is doing heavy marketing in uh south america right now or do they have some sort of uh, affiliate with a south american site that you know of i i do think that they do it i i i am really sorry i don't have the name of the site on hand, but I think that they have a skin that caters to uh, South American players, just as they have a um, they have a skin for like Russian players too, or Eastern Euro- or Western European players. 
Yeah, Eastern you'll see like Russia like or Belarus. Yeah, exactly, you'll see that a lot. Yeah, yeah. The, that one's called Poker King. So I know they have an affiliate system up there for that, and uh, they have a lot of players from that side of the world who who play on that skin. Well, maybe the one uh, in Brazil is called South America's Card Room. <laughs> yeah, I, I really wish I, could <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um. Well, that's okay. We don't need to know the name of it, but I just I noticed that, and that was something that I hadn't uh, seen as much before. I think that's some something new um, that has also changed the uh, the the player pool, if you will. Um, so, a couple questions for you about uh, how you approach the game. Sure. Uh, when you first sit down at a table, uh, and maybe you click on click around and see who's at your table, if you don't recognize their names. Which I guess after six months off, there probably there must be so many new names that you don't know. Um, if you notice that a player is from Brazil or Portugal or Belarus, would you make a certain assumption about that player, absent any other evidence uh, about the style you'll expect or no? No, not really, not anymore. I think I used to have a better grasp on all of that. Um... I don't know. Maybe maybe a couple of years ago, I think that that even and, and even longer than that, I suppose there used to be like certain player types. You you could you could kind of know a strategy that a certain part of the world might be working on, right? But I am sort of out of the loop with all of that, and I can't really tell. I think that there are just tough players from all over the place, and there are weak players from all over the place. I know. Okay, I'll say this. I don't know if this is, I want to be careful with how I say this because I don't want it to come across any unintended way, but I'll just say it as honestly as I know how. I will say that from countries that are more like third world or poorer countries, if you see people playing from those countries, I assume them to be good players because I assume them to be backed players. Does that make sense? It does. So I assume that they have a backing deal with somebody, and the reason why they're able to get backing is because they probably have some talent for the game. So when I see people from a lot of the South American countries, in a lot of cases, I assume them to be pretty good poker players. Yeah, and actually, in my experience, they have been. Mm -hmm. Um, You'll see uh, players from Brazil. Now, when I'm in the live realm, if I see a player from Brazil or Portugal, uh, Argentina... They tend to be a little bit looser and wilder um, as a people than the American players in the live realm. And, of course, th- this is a gross generalization. I'm not suggesting that there are no tight players from Argentina because, of course, there are. But, you know, if you see somebody and he's wearing like a Brazil soccer shirt or something at the table uh, and I have a snap judgment because in live you, you don't have a HUD or whatever – and we'll get to that in a minute because I want to ask you if you use a HUD and stuff. But, you know, live, of course, there's no such thing. So you kind of have to get a feel for how you expect a player to play. And you're not going to, you know, risk your entire tournament life on that. But all other things being equal, if you have a close decision, I would gen- generally assume that uh, those players from those countries who are at the World Series of Poker or wherever else I might encounter them live, uh, those players will generally be. Uh, if they're making mistakes, they would be of the too loose and too aggressive variety as opposed to the too tight and too scared and too timid, too nitty variety, um, if that makes sense. But what I've noticed on sure, uh, what I've noticed on ACR, though, is quite the opposite. Like they tend to be tight, aggressive, yeah. which is a very winning style. That's that's really funny because I was going to say that that's what I was going to say is that I've noticed that a lot of the South American players – to be really like kind of tight, aggressive players, really solid tournament players, you know. Yeah, solid. That's that's the right word for it. Like, you know, they would they wouldn't get too far out of line no matter what's going on at the table. So yeah. if you see like a big four bet shove pre flop and it says Brazil, I mean it's gonna be aces or kings almost every time. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I think I still have a little like. Uh, uh what's the word i don't i'm trying to think of the way to say it it's not ptsd but i think i have a little bit of like yes i'm like you know um i don't know just like memory of like pre-black friday if you saw brazilians at your table they were animals man they were complete crazies yeah like they would just be shoveling chips into the middle with any old hand and nowadays it's like 
it's like I have to like remind myself like, oh no, no, no. Brazilians are much more like solid and tag nowadays than they were 10 years ago because 10 years ago when they were first like coming into the online world, or at least I was recognizing them coming into the online world. Yeah. They were way more loose aggressive, you know? Yeah. It was a wild game, but these are not your father's Brazilians. No, they're not. <laughs> no, 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 no. My father used to get a Brazilian every Sunday just to keep things clean. <laughs> Couldn't help it. Sorry, I'll be here all week. All right. So let's get into the HUD here, Jason, because I want to sure. know, uh, do you use a HUD? Now, one of my um, poker mentors, I don't know if I should say his name, so I won't, um, is a, a very well-known European professional that's given me a few lessons. And he plays, you know, 10, 12, 16 tables at a time and never uses a HUD. So uh, I used to think that, um, playing without a HUD was putting myself as a disadvantage, but then I watched him do it, and he like basically just follows. Uh, you know, he's he, he's one of these GTO guys. You know, what I mean, like he knows all his ranges. He knows what to, like he basically can play. I don't want to say like a robot, but let's just say he basically starts with GTO and will only deviate from that if he sees something that he sure is exploitable. Yeah, so. that's uh, that's kind of the you just you could have just been talking about me. Yeah, that's what you do uh, too. Yeah. Well, in game, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do use a HUD, but I use it to study off of. Like I, I collect all my hands in it. I kind of take a look and see how things are going, see if there's a certain maybe position that I need to sharpen up on, or if there's, you know, maybe I'm not three betting enough, or maybe my C bet stats are out of whack, or you know, I'll go through like a, how things been going for the last month, say, and see what I need to sharpen up on, and and um. And that kind of thing. That's what I find useful for the HUD. I find it really difficult to sort of trust a lot of the in-game stats because the samples are small in tournaments in general, and the, um, you know, the the how do you uh, the nature of tournaments are they're always sort of changing. So you might have a bunch of hands on somebody, but does that really tell you what their ranges are going to be like? If you're 100 blinds deep or if you're 20 blinds deep, like where did you collect those hands? What was their average big blind during the hands that you've collected? It's very difficult to know all of that right away um, in game. So for me, I just find it better to, you know, have a good strategy going in, kind of sticking to that strategy, uh, deviating, you know, when the time is right. If I see something very obvious that, that needs me to deviate from it. But, um, yeah, that's that's my approach as well. Okay, so maybe that is kind of the online way. And I feel like in live, it's, you know, of course, at the very, very top levels of live poker. I mean, like the super high roller bowl and similar like high rollers where you just see the same nine guys competing for those titles all the time. Like mm -hmm. four Germans and like David Peters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like those, event, like those are basically people mostly playing GTO or trying to follow a theoretically optimal strategy. Um, but typically in live poker, there's a lot more exploitative play that's going on, a lot more based on reads. Like, I think you're bluffing, so I'm going to call, even though a computer would tell me to fold. There's something about the way you wipe the, spread off, the sweat off your brow or whatever. You know, I mean, I'm, of course, I'm exaggerating. Most of us don't make decisions just based on one little physical mannerism. But I do think you get a lot more information live. And maybe the fact that you're not getting that information when you're playing the online game makes it more necessary to rely on a mathematically correct, theoretically optimal strategy. Do you think that's fair? I do. I do. Great. Great. So how many tables can you play at a time? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I uh, When I was playing like higher stakes tournaments online, I would never go more than six. And a lot of times... Uh, not even more than four in, in lots of uh, time in my career. Like four to six was like kind of where I was really comfortable. But recently, since I've come back, I've uh, lowered the buy-ins that I'm playing and I'm playing much smaller overall. And so I am, you know, I'm playing 12 to 15 tables at a time most of the time these days. Oh, like maybe 15 tables of like $10 tournaments or something like that? Uh, I would say the average buy-in is around 30 bucks. So okay. I'm playing like mostly like say 55s and under. And then like when there's a really juicy 109s, like uh, a 109, like on the weekend on Sunday, 
there's a 109 300 k i don't miss that one or if these series that come through there seems to be random 109 100 k's or 150 k's during the week i'll play those as well okay but i don't i don't play like the 109 20 k say or um or even the 50 k i just there's so much other stuff that's really good 55 and under and so that just kind of feels more comfortable with my bankroll and all that kind of stuff great great and are there any other tools that you like to use um you said that you like to use the HUD mostly to analyze your own play and make sure that your ranges and uh, decision making is in line with uh, the you know, the GTO models. Uh, are there any other tools that you use when you play? Sure, I use uh, I use something called Table Tamer, which I just started using in the last couple of weeks. And um, if I was, I figured if I was going to up my um, volume like that, then I would need something to sort of organize it a little bit better because I felt like. I was spending so much time in game organizing the tables so that the, so that they were actually playable and I knew where everything was that uh, table tamer makes it so much easier it makes I have I have to spend very little time organizing now almost no time organizing because it just does all the organization for me which is really really nice okay so I love the name table tamer whoever thought of that name is a uh, you know it sounds really cute um what it sounds like you're saying that it's just like how the tables are arranged like actually on your monitor like on your desktop yeah, sure so the way that i would before i use table tamer and say i was going to play 12 or 15 tables or whatever the case may be i would have like four kind of tiled on the left and center part of my screen and then on the right side i would have cascading the rest of them and i would just have like the four um, the four tournaments that say were furthest along would be tiled, so I could kind of keep my eye on them all the time, and and then the other ones would sort of be cascading. But you know they might be difficult to find if like um, you know, say I just want to pull up one of the tables very fast, or um, yeah, whatever. Like if they, they would just be more difficult to organize, like to put a new table into the cascade properly into its proper space, or. To organize it, I used to try to organize it so that, you know, at the top of the cascade would be the table that was coming into the grid next. If that Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm trying to... So trying uh, to visualize it Yeah, I'm trying bit. to visualize it. You know, again, so, I, I've never tried to play 16 tables, so I don't even know how yeah. I would do that. <laughs> well, now what Table Tamer does is it gives me one square, we'll call it a square, and it has all of the tables underneath the square. And now if I'm playing a hand, it jumps the table that I'm playing a hand into a four square grid. So it, it jumps it over to where it would be in a tile of four. So if I'm playing four hands out of the tables, I'll be able to see all of those hands. And as I'm folding, I'm just clicking through and folding on the other stack and they're just kind of going back into the pile. You know wow. what I mean? Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I think that would really just yeah. make things easier to follow. Yeah, a absolutely. It makes things so much easier and, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm able to focus on the game so much. And you can kind of lock things into the grid. Like, say you have a table that's deep and you don't want it to be jumping back into the pile. You can just lock the table into one of the tile spots and it'll own that spot. Okay, so if somebody doesn't have, like, a three gigantic monitor set up or isn't able to concentrate on, you know, multiple screens at a time, this is a one way that that player would be able to manage a lot of tables all at once. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like I've, you know, I've always been like a two monitor guy, but not two monitors of playing. It would be one monitor for everything else in the world, and then one monitor for playing. Right. Okay. Like basically right. one monitor to check lobbies and to ch and to register more tournaments and that kind of thing, and then the other monitor was just what I'm playing on. You right. know. Yeah, and then one more for like cartoons and stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> You know, got to keep your mind, you know, calm while you're playing poker. Watch a little Ren and Stimpy or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all Ren right. And so, Stimpy, while you're showing your age here, Clayton. <laughs> man, I, I just you're think showing, the, you're showing our age. I yeah, think. right. Yeah. Well, I'm not a youngster by any stretch, <laughs> but I mean, I just don't think you could find a better cartoon to watch while you're playing poker than Ren and Stimpy. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, uh, are there any other tools that you use while you're playing, or is that enough? And and yeah. how big, how strong is your processor on your computer anyway? Oh, I have a real. I have way more computer than I'll I'll ever need. Uh, okay. I just bought a nice one back when I was streaming, so that way, like, I would never have any issues with, um, 
you know, lagging or freezing or anything like that. I just wanted something that would make everything go really smooth. And now that I no longer stream, or at least very, very rarely do I stream anymore, um, yeah, it's way more computer. I don't, I'm not like a computer guy, so I couldn't really tell you about it, but I just know that I spent enough money that I'd never have to worry about it for as long as this <laughs> computer was going to be uh, relevant, you know? Right, right. So you, I mean, and it is true, I'm generally with, things like high-end electronics you do get what you pay for so if you just spend enough money i'm sure you got plenty of computer even if you don't know the specifics of it yourself yeah. all right so uh about streaming so you know the last time we talked i know you were plugging you know your acr stormers and that you were streaming on twitch and then obviously you took six months off do you come back to like no followers or uh you know how does that work with uh, well, being a twitch streamer and then disappearing for a while well, so yeah, so you do have to kind of earn your audience back, right? Because those people who are watching you, in general, they're they're there to watch somebody play poker, and if you're not there, they're gonna find someone else to watch, right? Of course. So just when you come back, they're not just like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go back to that guy. Most of them are like, well, I'm I'm happy in the community I'm at now, so this is you know my number one stream, and maybe I'll go visit them later. But honestly, I just I'm not a streamer anymore. I have so much. I work so much with other streamers and like helping them grow their streams and the marketing side of things and, and all of that, that I just, I really don't have the time or energy to stream. And I certainly, if I'm going to be playing the kind of volume I play on the days that I play, um, I cannot possibly stream while I do that. You, know? <laughs> you got 15 tables going and you're trying to be entertaining at the same time. Yeah. Trying yeah. to like interact with an audience. Yeah. Right. I can barely interact with like family members if they want <laughs> <laughs> Well, you'd be proud of me, Jason, because uh, I don't think you know this, but I actually tried to do a Twitch stream of my own the other night. I don't know. Yes. I just felt inspired, and I fired up a $2 tournament on ACR. I actually ran pretty deep. I almost cashed in it. Um, yeah, I, I basically bubbled it. Um, but, yeah, I had my Twitch stream up, and you know, I have a really bad like old laptop. Obviously, I need to upgrade. And uh, I, I watched afterwards. It, it just it came out kind of blurry, and you know it, it didn't do that well. But I had like I think nine viewers at one point, which is pretty good for a guy who never streamed before. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. You know what's funny is uh, I didn't know that you were streaming when you were streaming, but I saw your like, hey everyone, thanks for everyone who came out. I had a great time. Like that, I saw that tweet after. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, I wish I would have known. I would have definitely stopped in. You know. Well, next time I'll make sure I invite you, but I think I'm going to have to wait until uh, I, I can get a new laptop because I just I don't want to subject anyone to the uh, picture quality and just the choppiness. It, it's just, you know, I just have I don't even have a desktop computer in my home. So uh, I basically just try to use like my three hundred dollar laptop and it just doesn't have the you know, it just doesn't have the firepower that we need for this. Sure, Not using sure. the Twitch studio or whatever program I was using. Um, but I did have fun, like just trying to figure out how to do it and that I was like proud of myself for just getting it up and running. Um, but e for me, just narrating one table and kind of explaining what I was doing and why on one single table was like really hard. Uh, you know, cause also I guess, you know, as a comedian, I'm also trying to make it entertaining for people and trying to be funny. Um, and so it was, it was taking like, it, I noticed it was, it was taking a lot of my brain power that's normally, uh, not needed while I'm playing online poker. So it's kind of a different skill. Like I really respect the uh, Spraggies of the world and those that have like a big, uh, you know, Twitch following and they they stream all the time. Or even, you know, like our own Killing Bird, Derek, like, you know, he's streaming quite a bit. And, you know, he's, he's really good at it. You know, he makes it fun while he's playing. And uh, what I like about his is he doesn't really take it too seriously. Yeah. 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 He's, got a, he's got a really entertaining stream too. Yeah. So how do yep. you help players build their following and, and stuff like that so once my new laptop comes I, I know i'll be able to you know uh get some help from you but how would you what kind of tips would you give someone that's kind of like me thinking about trying to getting into that poker streaming world so there's a few things so the, the streaming game has definitely changed over the last few years a few years ago it was basically like if you just show up and you show up often and you just stream a ton You'll get a you'll you'll eventually gain an audience, and that was sort of the the trick. Be halfway talented at what you're doing, be mildly entertaining, and be very consistent, and you win. Right? That was right. sort of a a way of winning. 
And now over the last couple of years, it's turned into, well, it's really difficult to sort of get discovered on Twitch. That's been something that has been figured out, right? So you have to uh, be very active on, say, Instagram and YouTube and Twitter and whatever other social medias the kids are messing with these days. And, um, you know, a big part of the people who are winning on Twitch and who are getting the biggest audiences, they're inviting people who they've introduced themselves to on other platforms to their Twitch stream. Oh. So that So that is a a much bigger focus now for people who are trying to grow. It's like, Hey man, you got to get your stream and your Instagram stories. And Hey man, you got to put out two YouTube videos a week. And Hey man, you got to make sure your all your tweets are like centered around inviting people to your stream and pointing out your stream and offering them something to come to your stream and, and, uh, and, and all of that kind of stuff, you know? Well, it sounds like a lot of work. What kind of pot of gold is at the end of this rainbow? Like, it, it depends on how good you are. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, look at some of the, I don't want to talk about the poker streamers necessarily because I'm not even really sure, like, how many subs or anything like that, like, they have at the top. But, uh, you know, like, there's gamers out there who are making, you know, seven figures. And some of that is, isn't just, like, their revenue from Twitch, but it's, like, they're able to get sponsorship deals from companies to mention and talk about their products on their stream. And they're able to make a ton of money doing that because their, their audience is so big, you know? Right. But I don't know if anyone has that kind of, you know, uh, audience on in the poker realm. Yeah. I mean, maybe Lex is the only one flirting with it and I don't even know if he's big enough, you know? Right. Yeah. Lex is the top one, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, he does occasionally get up to like 10, 12,000, people in his stream. And I think if he consistently had 10, 12,000 people, he would definitely be able to get sponsorship deals. And maybe he does. I don't know anything about his stream really. I honestly have rarely ever even stopped in to watch it. And it's not because I don't like it. It's just because I have 70 streamers that I manage. And so I don't really have time to, uh, I don't do a lot of, um, uh, watching streams as like a pleasure thing. You know. Yeah, I don't watch a lot of comedy when I come home from work either. <laughs> yeah, you're missing out because there's so much good stuff out there. By the way, I wanted to ask you about that. I don't know if we can, if you want to really derail down that road too much, but I was going to ask you: Are you still doing comedy? How is that going? I'm really interested in it because I like stand-up comedy is one of my favorite things to do is spend time watching that stuff. So yeah, no, for sure. Let's take a minute and talk about you know the state of comedy right now. Um, basically worldwide, there is a comedy shutdown, um, as almost nobody is going places to like have drinks and watch performances. Sure. Um, so some people are making videos, uh, like a lot of my friends are like becoming YouTube video content creators. They're doing like sketch comedy. Stand up doesn't really work without a live audience. I mean, I've seen like, you know, come join me for my Instagram live, uh, Stand up from my living room, you know, or whatever. And people are doing that. Or like my friend Sam Morrill, who's a, an amazing comedian, by the way. He, yeah, he's a friend of mine. Oh, yours. you know That's Sam? Awesome. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar I mean, with his work for sure. He's a phenomenal comedian. And yeah, he's, he's doing like, stand up for his mother, right? So he's like, <laughs> listen to, he, like, he'll go on Instagram and, like, do, like, he'll, like, bounce some joke ideas off his mother. And then it's like, yeah, you know, he calls it, like, bombing in front of my mom, you know, or whatever. So That's like, awesome. There is That's a way to so do it, fun. but it, even that kind of proves you need some kind of audience, even if it's just one person, and that one person is your mother. <laughs> like, we just yeah, need, yeah. you know, it's just when you're doing comedy and there's no one laughing, uh, it's just so hard to tell what's working and what isn't. I wonder if... Uh... I wonder if you're doing it on a live stream where chat can interact with you. If you're getting LOLs, it's not going to be the same as like when you hear the laughter. But if you're seeing the feedback of like, oh my God, this is hilarious or LOLs or that kind of thing. So I've done some commentary for Poker Stars um, and for the World Series of Poker. A lot of people know like David Tuckman and I worked together, um, especially the year that it was on Twitch, which I believe was 2018. Poker Go and Twitch kind of got together, and then last year we did it on, I think, a lesser known platform called CBS All Access, and I'm not saying that ironically. I just don't think that many people have CBS All Access. Yeah, not unless you're a huge Survivor nerd, like, <laughs> yeah. like at least half of this call. 
<laughs> okay, so you have CBS All Access. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> I need to survive, wanna, unfortunately. Don't want to like... miss that backstage survivor banter. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, and the, in both of those formats, whether it, or on Poker Go or wherever else I've done commentary, there is some type of either. Well, with Twitch, it's great because you can actually see the comments, like you say, in the chat box on the stream, which is great. Um, but even when we were doing it on Poker Go or on CBS All Access, which doesn't offer that, you know, chat column or whatever, uh, you still have your Twitter feed where people are like, oh, uh, the joke that. Clayton just made with David Talkman was a real bomb or whatever, you know, just whatever kind of feedback, even the negative feedback is valuable uh, to a comedian because basically comedians are scientists. Um, and we, we only way that we can work is through experimentation. So um, we just have to try this or that and find out what's funny. Um, but that kind of sets you up for the disappointment of tournament poker, which almost every time you play, you don't win first place. So, uh, you know, you just you keep trying, and then when it does happen, you feel like you hit that grand slam home run. And every so often, you'll just have a show where every word you say is hilarious. And so, like in a way, the two uh, careers that I have feed the same part of my brain: the gratification of doing something that's really hard to do. Uh, you know, I am trying to still maintain my creativity. Uh, this podcast has been a great outlet for me. Um, and I've been helping other comedians with their uh, sketches and their material. So I'm still working as a writer, although there's nothing like uh, performing in front of a live audience. And I just don't know when I'm going to get to do that again. And so uh, it, it, and I have no interest in being like a YouTube comedian or I, I just I can't. I need the crowd, man. I just can't do it without. You know, I was doing some really great shows right before all this happened, including a week at Brad Garrett's Comedy Club at the MGM Grand out in Vegas. And all oh, those nice. shows were unbelievable. And like I was really starting to pick up some momentum, and now I've had to cancel a bunch of gigs. So I have a, a, a quick little, I guess not really a story, but I, me and my wife a few years back went to the Brad Garrett Comedy Club when they were doing a show there one night. And I didn't know any of the comics on the bill, although it was, it was really good, like from front to back. You know, they just progressively got better and better, which I think is sort of the thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, Brad Garrett, the, he hosted it, obviously. And he, you know, he so he did his like five minutes or ten minutes in between each set. And oh, my God, this guy just murdered. He was so <laughs> funny. And my wife and I were laughing so hard at times. It was just unbelievable. And the thing that really was surprising to me is like, we both went, we were like, yeah, he was funny on everybody loves Raymond, but he's the everybody loves Raymond, like weird older brother guy. So we weren't really expecting all that much. And we just died. It was so funny. No, he's a, he's a terrific comedian. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he's also a really, really great guy. He takes care of the talent. Like everybody uh, that does comedy wants to be at that club. I was so honored to have a chance to to work there. Nice. Um, you know, and he's you know he's so wonderful to work for, um, and he's terrible at poker. So, best of all, <laughs> if you do a show at the club and then you can get him to go play some cards with you, at least you know you got one fish at the table. <laughs> 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 all right, so let's get into some strategy. Enough of this, uh, uh, you know, talk about life and stuff. People want to hear about hands. Most of them fast sure. forward till they hear me talking about big blinds or M. So uh, do right. you have a hand for us? We are at a nine-handed table, and we are in the $55 100K, where we are 90 big blinds deep. Uh, and is this – sorry, Jason. Is this a tournament that happens on Sundays, or is it every week? Do you know? It's a, it's a daily tournament. Oh, it's okay. Daily, it's every an day. afternoon tournament. Yeah, oh, okay. but they have on uh, – that they have on ACR. Yep. It's like, uh, I want to say it starts around 1230 central time. Okay. So I guess 130 Eastern or so. Um, but yeah, it's a great tournament and, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of fun, a lot of fun happening in this tournament. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um, so, so we're opening the button. I, I only opened to two big blinds. Uh, the average stack at the table is probably around 25 to 30 big blinds, uh, even though the big blind is quite deep. Um, we're opening 8-6 suited here on the button, 8-6 of clubs. Okay, so it folds to us uh, on the button with 8-6 of clubs, and yep. we have 90 big blinds. The That's right. The small blind has how many? 20 big blinds. And the big blind has? Has eight, 85 big blinds. Okay, 
And I'm assuming that because we're playing so many tables, we don't really have reads on our opponents, nothing that stood out. Yeah, there's only one player at the table that I really even recognize and um, where he's not in this hand. So, yeah, these are this is just a, first a random opponent to me. OK, OK, mm-hmm. but we're assume we know we're not in the money yet. And uh, it's possible that some players now that registration now I've noticed. Tell me if you agree that in some of the tournaments at this buy in level, uh, players tend to get a little tight right after registration closes um and i don't know if it's because they think they're closer to being in the money than they actually are or if they just they know they can't re-enter the tournament anymore but i've noticed that for many of my opponents the uh the playing style seems to change after that last call for registration have you noticed that as well sure i think that's a fair generalization i think that's probably a fair generalization across most tournaments that are getting close to the money like almost anywhere right yeah Um, for sure yeah, players seem to tighten up in those spots and like everybody wants to cash and, um, you know, especially the higher the buy in, the more everybody wants to cash. So I don't know. And online, this is sort of a medium stake buy in, but you're getting towards the higher buy ins at fifty five dollars. Um, if we're considering like one oh nines and up high buy ins. Sure, we are. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, I think people want to cash this. It's like close to a hundred bucks for a min cash. And that's, you know, that's not nothing. That's not nothing, and but we don't think we're really close to the money now, right? We're just we're post registration. We're probably not that far from the money, but we're probably still 150 or 200 people away. <laughs> right, because ACR it seems like once registration closes, you are almost in the money. <laughs> yeah, it does. well, yeah, because it's like seven days of late reg. So. <laughs> We're on day six here. Yeah. So you're basically, <laughs> we're just past day seven, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can buy in on the bubble, basically. All right. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay, so yeah, I don't think there's any controversy about opening the 8-6 of spades. Why do you open uh, for the min raise here? Is that just your standard or is there... Kind of a standard thing. I think if I... Honestly, I'm not going to defend it because I think if I would have realized how deep the big blind was, I probably would have raised a little bit larger. I probably would have went like more like 2.5 or 2.7, something like that with my whole range, just because we are playing quite deep stacked and I do want to charge the big blind for playing out of position. Yeah, and uh, with his stack, he can pretty much call with uh, you know so much of his range, and we'd really prefer to get this guy to fold something with. Uh... Of course, of course, and we well we and we definitely you know we want to make it more difficult for him post slop when he does choose to play you know yeah yeah um, for sure. But that said, if he had like say sub forty big blinds, I would always just min raise. Yeah, you because know? you're already doing enough damage to that. Okay, yeah. so we raise to two big blinds, and the small blind folds, and the big blind comes along. Okay, so we're going to be heads up in position. Yep, there's an ante, so now there's like five and a half big blinds in the middle. Okay. And the flop comes five, queen, seven with one club. So we flopped an open under and a backdoor flush draw. Okay. So queen, seven, five with one club. And we have the eight, six of clubs. I'm assuming that everybody always checks to us here. Uh, Yeah. I mean, mostly they're going to check to us. He does check to us in this situation. So let's talk about that sizing now. Assuming if we do bet here, what kind of sizing would you like to see? We can probably get away with a pretty small sizing here. This is a spot where if our opponent has something like Jack-10, 10, 10-9, 10, uh, so many hands in his range, even like an ace-deuce type of hand, I don't think that he can call even a small bet. And because it's basically does he have a queen or not, uh, I mean, of course, it will call you with a seven or a five as well. But we can barrel him off of those hands. Yeah, that's the point I was going to make, because I totally agree with everything you said. I think a small bet here, I'm hoping I did make a small bet. We'll see in a second. But uh, I, I think in general, if I'm playing, if I was playing this hand right now, I would want to bet small. And one of the reasons, like you said, is they will call with a five or a seven. But there are a lot of turn cards that we can barrel them off of. The thing is, if we make it a large bet and they call or raise us, we really mess ourselves up with an open-ended straight draw. Because if they raise us, they might be able to raise us off of the hand. And if they 
call, then it's much more difficult for us to bet again on the turn without committing a large portion of chips because we've made such a large bet on the flop, right? Right. So let's put some numbers to this. Like if we bet four big blinds into five and a half big blinds Mm -hmm. and then our opponent raises to like 15 big blinds, which isn't yeah. unreasonable at all. And that's like a pot size raise, right? A little less. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then it, it's now we're very unhappy because we kind of have to call, I guess. Yeah, but it's like then we can't call again on the turn if he fires another big bet. Right, another big bet on the turn gets us off our hand. Yeah, exactly. So we don't get to realize our equity often enough. You right, know? now he can still do that if we bet two and a half big blinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even like if we bet, like, say we bet closer to, say, like a third or a quarter pot and we bet like 1.6 to 1.8 or something like that. And then he re-raises us to, you know, six big blinds or seven big blinds. Right. And he could still raise us to 15 big blinds in that spot, but no one ever does. Like, you don't see the big check raise for twice the pot. You just don't see that. So I don't worry about anyone doing that. So you can kind of basically dictate the amount of the check raise, the size of the check raise, yes. by controlling the size of the original bet. Yep. On times you're going to face a check raise, yes, you can. If you if you size down your bet, you're going to face a smaller one. When you're playing really deep deep stack with a hand that has a fair amount of equity, like an open ender with a backdoor flush draw, you don't want to be folding that on the flop or turn too often, you know? Yeah. So I'd probably put in like two big blinds here. You're even saying go a little smaller, like 1.7, 1. 1.8. I'm all for it. Yeah, uh-huh. I think anywhere between 1.5 and 2 big blinds is perfect. I think if we start getting above 2, we're going a little bit too much, I think, personally. Okay, so 2 or less seems about right to you. Yeah, um, we'll, I don't know what I bet here. I assume I see about this because I almost always do. Yeah. But I'm not sure yet what the size is going to be. So I love this... that. It's like we're opening this package up together. And then yeah. my plan would be, my plan in doing so would be, this way I'll be able to call the check raise that's probably not coming. Because really, what hand is he check raising us with, you know? Like, we block the open end straight draw because we actually have it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And know. we even block gut shots like 8-9 and, yeah. uh, and stuff like that, too. So um, I don't think the check race is even coming very often, but it's yeah, still it's, nice to know that we super, can call it. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So we do bet, and we bet 1.74 big blinds. Look at that. Beautiful. Yep, and he he makes it 5.94 big blinds, so about six big blinds is what he did. Okay, so first question is, mm-hmm. um, now I was going to say before that my hand, my plan for the hand would be to bet small here on the flop, probably getting called a lot, and then getting checked to again on the turn and planning on a making a pretty big bet myself on the turn regardless of whether I made my straight or not. Yeah, 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 I like that. I like that line a lot, and I think that's the same line I would go for, and I I think the only turns that I might decide not to bet are as if another five or seven or queen rolled off. And maybe even a queen I would still bet again a lot of the time, especially if it was like another club rolled off and it was the queen. Like say it was the queen of clubs, I'd probably bet that card. Right, because that card would actually add a a flush draw to our open ender. So yeah, 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 yeah. But if it was another five or seven, I might go ahead and just check back our hand at that point. But any other card, two, three, four, six... Uh, eight, nine, ten, jack, king, or ace, I would probably feel very comfortable in betting again. Yeah, okay, agreed. So we kind of have the same approach to this hand, which is uh, always nice when that happens. It makes me feel like I'm smart <laughs> when you agree with me. All right, nice. so uh, instead we do get check raised. And now before we even decide what we're going to do about it, Jason, let's just talk about what possible hands we could be up against, against an unknown opponent I mean, I suppose you could have a lot of two pair type hands. Queen yeah, so, seven, seven five. Like we only min raise pre flop, so he could possibly even have queen five here, I guess. So I'm seeing lots of check raises these days in these situations, especially deep stacked, especially verse um like people are check raising verse ranges that are likely to be wide. So your button ranges, your cutoff ranges, even some hijack ranges, you're gonna be getting check raised from the de- big blind defender much more often these days, at least in my experience. Mm. So what I'm seeing is like guys with bottom pair and middle pair, and like obviously all of his two pair are going to be check raising. And if he happened to flop a set, he's going to be check raising. Um, Although I think if he had queens, he would have three bet pre and probably just called fives and sevens. So he does have a couple of sets, but one of the sets he doesn't have ever. 
Um, but he's definitely going to have some queen seven, some queen five, some five seven. Um, you know, he could possibly have a draw like eight nine. We do have an eight, so less of those. He's going to have some three four, maybe some you know six four. Um, you know, some of those other straight draws, and then occasionally he's just going to have some air hand because he thinks that we're uh, raising a wide range and sea betting a wide range on this flop, which is probably not an awful uh, generalization by him versus you know most players. And he's probably printing money by having a uh, exploitably wide check raising range. I mean, it sounds to me like a pretty bluff heavy range. Yeah. So I don't know this particular player. Like I don't, like I said, I don't have a HUD up in game. I don't even have a HUD up. I don't have the numbers up of this player um, in this review right now because I don't have it up in game. So there's no point of me knowing what he would actually do uh, today in, in game. My thought process is, I'm getting check raised so often from the big blind when I open the button and then see bet that I've seen so many different combinations of hands uh, get to showdown from the guys who are check raising and they're including an insanely wide range of hands. Yeah, and you know, I might even, honestly, I might even do that myself here if I had something like ace five. Sure. Or five sure. four. Like yeah, if my hand's the best hand, I can just protect it and 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 you know make the the other guy fold out all of his equity. It's not a bad play at all. Yeah. Well, um, with all that said, and and again, you're not talking about this particular player. You're saying that you're noticing this trend versus the field at large, not against yes. this particular opponent. Right. But still, so, if this is what a lot of people are doing, then should we consider three betting this check raise here with our open ender, or is that so, just crazy? So you could do that, but then if you get jammed on, you just flush all that equity down the toilet. So I really don't like that play specifically. But I'd say I would say this: this is a trick that I'm going to give. Um, that you know, I'm sure there's people out there who who realize this or not, but I feel like this is one of my uh, uh, one one of the plays I have up my sleeve, right? And that because people are check raising so often these days, I almost always float it, especially being this deep stacked. Even if I have, say, complete air here, I'm going to float it in position. And like nine out of ten times when they have nothing, they just check the turn and you just bet again and they fold. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say that check raise is usually going to be his only attempt to win the pot. And if he encounters any more resistance, even in the form of just a call, from us, he's going to shut down and say, all right, well, I tried to win this pot, that, and obviously that, Jason has a real hand. Yes, that's the normal thing that I see. Now, occasionally you get double check raised, but that's so rare. I would say that's less than 1 in 100, and and you're very rarely, I would say, less than 10% of the time getting check raised and then check called. It's just not something that happens very often, right? Right, because the value line would typically be check raise and then bet. That. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that check on Fourth Street is usually, if not always, almost always, a give up. If they yeah, if they check on Fourth Street after check raising the flop, it's it's just like a give up. Yeah, the vast vast majority of the time. I love but, it. Yeah. No, that's a great. I mean, that's a great tip. So anyone so, who anyone who is listening to this podcast um, who hadn't thought about that before, um, you know, now this will change in the next three to four, maybe five years, where players will start check raising with value and then checking again because they notice that they're getting floated you know as the game catches up it's always a cat and mouse situation but at least at this moment in time it's very rare to see a player check raise for value and then check again on the turn so what i'm saying is i basically print money uh floating check raises and then just betting like a quarter or 40 percent pot or whatever on turns when they check to me and just taking it down then that's probably going to be even more true button versus blind. Yeah, where ranges are very wide on both parts. Yeah. Outstanding. All right, so I assume here we just call. Yeah, yeah, we do. I I mean, if I don't just call here, I'm going to be very surprised because it's just this is what I would do with basically a, I don't think I have any three bets here. I always just call the check raise with my whole entire range on a board like queen 7 5 rainbow when I bet and they uh, check raise me at this stack depth. Even if you had a set of queens? Yeah, I don't feel like there's any reason to re-raise because he's just like got so many bluffs and so, like what value hands does he have? You yeah, know? you could just hope it's set versus set or, or else your three or, bet is probably going to yeah. lose him. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if and if he did set versus set, we're gonna get all the money later anyway. It's gonna so, happen so either way. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no reason to, you know, make him fold out his gut shots and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. Um. So we do call, and now there's about 17 and a half blinds in the middle, and we're playing effectively 77 big blinds deep, and a six of diamonds comes on the turn. So that gives two diamonds on the board. Um, but it's queen, seven, five, and six on the turn. Okay, so now we have two diamonds on the board, and we yep. also have a pair of sixes where before we just had the open ender with our eight six of clubs. So yes. opponent who has check raised on the flop. And he checks. Okay, so this is the exact scenario you just talked about. So if he check raised on the flop and got called, you're saying this check on 4th Street is almost always a give up <laughs> so yeah. it seems like if we just make a small bet here like a quarter pot we should be able to take it down yes that would be my assumption here that's you know i went i think you know i think in this situation i can kind of go back and forth between i think i lean towards betting pretty heavily here not not heavy heavily sized just heavily in like in terms of the vast majority of the time I'm going to want to bet, even though we turned a pair. Because if we can get him to fold a seven, that's a huge win. And if we can get him to fold two overs, you know, we deny him that equity, and that's a good win too, right? Sure. Just take, taking down the pot right now. So I think I like betting our six, even though now we have a little tiny bit of showdown value. Um, But yeah, yeah, yeah. So I assume we're going to bet here. And we do. And like you said, it was a little bit more than a quarter pot. I bet about a third pot. I bet 5.87 blinds, so around six blinds into about 17 and a half. And he he calls. Okay. So we're so a little surprised by that call. Yes. He might have the same hand that we have. So he could, and it makes you wonder if he has a hand like, say, 5.8 or 7.8 or 7.9 or 5.9, where he has like some kind of pair and gut shot, and he just is like, okay, now that I have like somewhat of a draw, I don't want to get blown off this hand, so I'm just going to check call. But I don't think he ever has a value hand like a straight or two pair because I think he would have just continued to barrel after check raising. Is that fair? I think that is fair, and I think that's a good way to, to look at it. Like He doesn't have the nuts here. He's not very nutty um, no. with the way he's playing this hand. Uh, but I agree that I mean he called us with something. Now, we only bet a third of the pot, so we offered him four to one on a call, so he might have something like, nine five right yeah who knows yeah. right sure, so he's sure. got like or, a little something but we, we could still be ahead of a lot of that even yes. with just our pair of sixes here i agree we could be ahead or we could be behind a bunch of what he has too because he could have a bunch of like just seven x hands you know sure. yeah because he um, could check raise with those hands as well so so i bet a brown six he calls and now there's 29 blinds plus just over 29 blinds in the pot and the ace of clubs comes out on the river so the first thing that i think about when i see the ace of clubs is that's a great card for our range uh but it's not such a great card for our hand because now our you know fourth or third pair turned to fourth pair i don't know i mean i did say that i would check raise this flop with something like ace five some of the time True. so like yeah there, there is some chance that this card gives our opponent two pair but i think that we just have so many more aces than he does. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it's a better card for us than it is for him. Um, but, you know, before you tell us what he does here on the river, I think we should have a plan that if he makes any kind of substantial bet or even like a smallish bet on the river, I think we should plan on folding a lot. See, I think that is an interesting thought because, look, when you think about his line, when you go check raise, check call, donk lead river, that just, like, smells like a bunch of malarkey to me. It just is like, are you serious? Like, what is it? What hand is it that you're saying you have here? So you're saying like, that he might see the ace as a card that he can try to use to scare us, even though we're the ones who open this pot? Well, I think if he actually had a good hand, he should think that that ace is a better card for our range. And if he has this beat, he should maybe consider check raising his hand. Like if he has, say he has a hand like ace five or ace seven, like we've already bet after getting check raised. So we're saying we have something pretty strong, right? 
Like sure. that's what that's what we're saying. We got check raised and we called. Then we bet after getting checked to after getting check raised. So when we get an ace on that river, now we have all the strong aces. He has none of the strong aces because he should be three betting all of those pre. So when he leads into us, to me, it's like, okay, one, you're a huge fish and you don't realize how good that card is for my range. And you don't realize you should be checking to check raise me when you have a very strong hand here. But two, he doesn't have any like super strong hands here because we already ruled out all the nut hands because they would have che- they would have bet again on the flop on the uh, turn on, on forestry or, or they would have like check raised the very small bet again even if the, he did decide to be tricky and check it after check raising right he wouldn't have just check called out of position for like a five blind bet into a seventeen blind pot right agreed so when I see this lead to me it's like he well. That is what happens, by the way. So oh, I'm, okay, great. That All is, right. he, he leads 21.56 blinds into the 29 blinds in the pot. And, uh, and yeah, so, like, I mean, we basically already talked about what I think of it. I think it's, I just don't, I don't buy it for a strong hand. I do think occasionally he'll wake up with an ace-5 or an ace-7, um, and I guess an ace-6 randomly that he check-raised the flop and then check-called the turn with, third pair but that's not very likely ace five and ace seven i think would be the most likely hands that we'd be up against that uh that beat us at this point but since we block the nuts and we know he doesn't have the nuts and i think this line is just super desperate by him and he's just really trying to win a pot that doesn't belong to him we tanked for a long time and we shoveled in 76.85 blinds on the (laughs) river here Okay, so just in case our sixes are no good, we need to get it all in and push well, him yeah, off yeah, of yeah. seven I don't, nine. I don't right. look, look, yeah, yeah, I want to get him to fold a seven or a weak queen or right. uh, something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want him to get rid of all that stuff. You know. Okay, so before and, you uh, tell us the results, Jason, uh, yeah. I want to say first, you you changed my mind about whether I would fold. Um, I like your play a lot better. I, I guess, like for me, because I I know that I would bet again on the river myself if i made two pair with that ace i would bet because you don't you have a lot of aces in your range but i have one in my hand and so you probably don't have one in your hand and you will be afraid to bet your queens again like if you have something like queen jack or king queen right which you could play this way the whole time uh now i'm afraid that you're going to get away from owning yourself with second pair. So I would bet my two pair. But even then, I think when you shove here, again, mm-hmm. if I have two pair, it's a tough decision. <laughs> I think it, I probably, I don't know well, what to do. I would bang it, my head against the wall. It would be a tough decision. But also, I think if you were really thinking through the spot, I think that you wouldn't assume I would bet a queen X hand on the turn after defending a check raise. I mean, I don't know if this is divulging too much to the audience about how I would play a hand here, but I'm just going to be super honest about it. And if I defend a check raise and then I continue to have top pair on a board that gets pretty coordinated on the turn and he checks to me, I might just check back the the queen and get to showdown with my top pair on the turn because I think he's going to fold a lot of worse hands when I bet. Like I think mostly he does fold. And what I want to do is give him an opportunity to bluff on the river. So I would check back, see if he'll bluff and just pick off his bluffs. You know, if I had a queen, because that's strong enough to not need to deny him equity. Right. Right. Okay. So you're We're saying like six, eight, I need to deny him equity. Got it. And so therefore you're betting on the turn is usually not going to be, with a hand like Queen Jack or King Queen. Honestly, like this line of mine, this is like this is not like a balanced play. This is a completely exploitative line when I'm when I'm when I'm floating check raises because people are like people have learned how to check raise flops, but then they have no idea what to do on turns. And... <laughs> yeah, how do I continue after that? Yeah, right, yeah, that's... yeah. They, they don't know what to do if they don't have it, you know. So it's really difficult for a lot of players. Now, there are really good players who know what to do, and they'll put you in tough spots, and you float them, and they bet again, and you just fold your hand, and that's that, right? But uh, but but so many players, they've like seen this concept in like whatever training program they're going through that they need to be check raising these flops, and then they just like you know shrink up if they if you call their flop bet, right? You know. Well, this is great. So does he call us? 
He tanked. I remember this hand now. And he tanked. <laughs> I was dying inside. I was so <laughs> glad that he only used about 50 seconds of his time bank because I'm pretty sure I was purple because I couldn't <laughs> breathe at all. Like, I couldn't breathe. I was just like, oh, my gosh. Like, I somehow am um, on, like, basically a stone-cold bluff for, like, a heap of chips in this tournament that's, like, you know, getting somewhat close to the money. It's, like, you know, 80% over or 75% over my average buy-in or 66% over my average buy-in or whatever. So it's, like, a meaningful spot for my bankroll, you know? Sure. And, uh, and, uh, and I was just like, well, I just went for it because I was just like, I don't – I guess I just don't believe his line. And, you know, sometimes you just have to be okay looking like a freaking idiot. And, uh, but we get to get lucky and he did, he did fold his hand and, uh, yeah, we won a huge pot there. So well, that's won. interesting. You know, that, a lot of times when you know, we start off by saying we are table chip leader for this hand and we're going up against like the other big stack at the table. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're not too far out of the money, you know, as we said, it's after registration on ACR, so you're always pretty close to the money at least. And then we just put in a whole bunch of chips with not much of a hand. Uh, the foundation, uh, the theory behind why you did that is so solid. Like, And especially, like to me, the, the key inflection point of this hand is our response to that turn. So if, I mean, to that check raise on the flop. So if he if he bets again on the turn... I think then we have a tougher decision, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, if he bet again on the turn, I think with a pair and an open ender, because of the size of the pot and our stack depth, we probably would have peeled one more. But then, then if fold. we don't improve on the river, we just fold or yeah. probably just go check, check if he checks because, you know, he's still going to have a whole bunch of hands that can bluff catch uh, if he goes check, raise, bet, and then check the river, you know? But he doesn't really have many bluff catchers when he goes check raise check call donk lead like <laughs> what the hell is that you know that's just like a look man if you ended up telling this story and you actually have a hand man then here here's a bunch of money you earned it bro because i don't buy it yeah you know well i love this hand jason this is great i like the way you know one thing that's really fun is having that eight you know i think that eight gives us a little bit more confidence yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right, you know? and, and like you said before, the naughtiest hands will lead the turn after their check raise yeah. gets called. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that is a pretty strong exploit right there, and I think that uh, it makes me want to play some poker tonight just to try to yeah, <laughs> see if I can find the spot. You find to yourself use. in some situations where people are check raising you. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's one of the things that I've learned over the last while here that uh, – you know, I just, you know, you see all the different training material out there. And like, you know, if you if you are watching any training material, there's all kinds of like, you know, people solving for check raises and running running stuff through solvers. Like this is the this is the hands Pio wants us to check raise after defending the big blind. And there's a ton of that stuff out there. And basically all of the training, you know, sites. And so you see lots of people just check raising just without a plan, like the check raise. And then there's no like follow through on the turn. They have no idea what to do. So it's like, OK, cool. You can check raise me, but then you're going to have to prove it on the turn, bro, because I'm right. Like I just that's just the way it's going to be. I'm going to float know? you a lot and I'm going to I'm going to have a plan even if you don't. So, yep, yep. yeah, I love it. Well, welcome back to poker, Jason, and welcome back to the podcast. This is a great hand and it's really fun you know, talking strategy with you and, and getting some of your your insights. Uh, how's it going after 50,000 hands back? Do you feel like you shook the rust off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, what's funny is I just looked over and ran the uh, um, the stats for this year, and it's actually for the last couple months it's 80,000 hands. And, yeah, I think the rough – I think the rust is off. I feel like – I feel pretty good. I definitely have some work to do. I do have to study some more. Well, you know, my favorite place to – shake the rust off if you will and keep sharpening my game is as always tournament poker edge there's so much content about how to play against a check raise uh, what to do when somebody check raises and then checks to you on the turn uh and every other possible situation with obviously some of the greatest coaches uh you know now is the time when a lot of us are sitting at home with no place to go and uh it's a great opportunity for us to be improving our games so, as you know, you can get on Tournament Poker Edge for as little as $25 a month. There's no better way to spend 25 bucks this month 
than to uh, check out what, what we have to offer at TPE. So, Jason, what else uh, can people be looking for from you? You're not streaming. Are you tweeting? <laughs> How can we uh, find you? I mean, mostly all my tweets are basically centered around um, promoting my team, you know, just promoting the streamers that are on Stormers and different things we have going on on ACR and that kind of stuff. Um, is, is there another team that you, like, stream against <laughs> yeah i've been i've been actually working on that behind the scenes with uh, a couple of guys in the community who kind of have um you know some pull with some of the other sites other than acr and we've been working on maybe getting teams together to, to run some kind of cool competition to sort of there's some like weird sort of tension and animosity in the uh community between like the acr streamers versus the rest of the um versus the rest of the american streamers and i don't really know exactly where it stems from um, but you know, we're trying to, you know, sort of bridge that gap and mend whatever issues there are by maybe creating something where we can all work together, which would be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, unfortunately I have no insight into what could be causing that animosity. <laughs> it just seems a little silly yeah. to me, but basically in every industry, uh, you'll just, you'll have people that, you know, for whatever reason, like our group is against their group. So I think it'd be a great thing if you could take that and, turn it into some kind of friendly competition. Um, yeah, obviously poker players by nature are competitive people. So I wonder if there's a way to kind of turn this, whatever kind of weird, like they don't like us and we don't like them and convert that into something good. Maybe do it for charity or, or whatever. I don't know, a challenge of some kind. I think so too. And like I said, we're working on something behind the scenes, trying to figure out a way that we can kind of make that happen. That makes sense for everybody. Um, but I would love to see that too. And, and, and like you said, it's sort of silly. Like why, why does there need to be that sort of like animosity? We're all kind of doing the same thing. We should like work together as a community because I kind of feel like I'm sort of of the school of thought that like what's good for poker is good for all the sites. So if like good things are happening on one site, then that, that should be something that can kind of lift up another site just because like, look, if, if one site's growing, the rest of the sites should be growing too, because that means people are coming into poker, you know? That's a great uh, thought to finish on tonight because something I keep reading everywhere I look during this quarantine with the uh, coronavirus is that we're all in this together. So, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a really nice thought. And I hope that uh, you could be a part of uh, maybe helping that. And I'm sure that you can. So anything else you want people to know before we say goodbye? No, I don't think so. I just appreciate you having me on again. I really enjoyed this like I always have, and uh, I almost forgot how much I enjoyed it. And now that we're doing it again, it's like, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, that's great because I always love having you on, so uh, everyone can look forward to more episodes and more incredible poker insights from Mr. Snost and Lost himself, Jason Smith. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. And for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you all so much for listening. Love it, it's not rough, it isn't fun, fun Oh, wow